Thank you very much. I would like to thank the AAPS for the invitation to attend uh, today's meeting. Uh, I've updated um, for some of you that may have seen my AMA presentation back in June. I posted it online and also the Pennsylvania Medical Society posted the presentation. I updated that presentation uh, for today's uh, presentation. Uh, the most recent uh, information or disclosure that was not available in June relates to ABIM's retirement plan and you'll be quite shocked at what I unearthed uh, with the help of Dr. Fisher sending me a link that I thought wouldn't go anywhere and I did some digging and lo and behold uh, I tripped over another one of ABIM's uh, fiascos. So uh, I'm a CPA, I've been a CPA for 35 years. I've been in healthcare for 25 years on the provider side, uh, typically at medical clinics, but on occasion uh, working uh, in, uh, for clinics affiliated with hospital systems in San Diego and uh, currently in Minneapolis. You can, I, I tweeted this out about an hour or two ago, you can uh, follow my presentation or, or look at it at your convenience. I tweeted it out. Uh, you can, uh, it's available at this, at uh, that uh, web address um, in HTML format. I tweeted out a PDF format if you have trouble reading the HTML format. People have asked why I put uh, where I was born. I was uh, born on the south side of Chicago. I, I think it's no coincidence that Dr. Fisher and I are from Chicago. Uh, and I see a few hands being waved there. Uh, I was raised in uh, Chicago Heights, which was a mob-run town. Uh, didn't get the attention that Cicero did. Uh, my father did business with the outfit, as they called it. Uh, so I grew up around a culture of corruption, and as I like to say, I can smell corruption and deep dish pizza from, from a mile away. <clears throat> so, uh, but back to my point, I don't think it's a coincidence that Dr. Fisher and I are from Chicago. You know, it's a very corrupt culture in Chicago. I think what we're seeing with ABIM and ABM, uh, ABMS is uh, a byproduct of that culture of corruption, but you know you can fool some people uh, all of the time and all the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all of the time, and you certainly can't fool people that grew up around this corruption. So um, I I stumbled over this story by accident actually uh, in the summer of 2014. Dr. Linda Gerges uh, wrote an article about uh, extortion and mock in July of 2014. That caught my attention. And uh, I just have a few disclosures. I wanted to make clear that I'm not a physician. I can't uh, and uh, will never be able to address the clinical issues regarding mock, obviously. I'm not an attorney, although I've been asked by journalists and others uh, for a legal opinion on uh, what, AB, what I've unearthed with ABIM, of course, I can't render a legal opinion. Um, and uh, I was not put up to the story by any organization. In the spring of 2015, when Eichenwald uh, broke this story, uh, some internal communication within ABIM made its way back to me. And of course, they were, uh, trying to figure out who put me up to it. And I'm pleased to say nobody did, which is a big problem for them because they can't shut me down through back channels, through an employer or other. <clears throat> of course, they tried to discredit me as a crackpot stooge of the anti-mock forces. And uh, uh, you know, they, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm basically untouchable. So in, in one way, someone like me coming out of the blue, uh, independent CPA with healthcare experience, nonprofit accounting experience, 
was in many ways their worst nightmare come true. Uh, some attorneys I've talked to that I've tried to uh, uh, get involved in class action lawsuits or other types of lawsuits against ABIM uh, have indicated that ABIM has been quote unquote hiding what they've been doing in plain sight, which in a sense is true because the, the uh, financial data that I uncovered, tripped over if you will, uh, back in the first week of August of 2014 was available online, but I don't think anyone ever put the pieces together. And when I first tripped over it, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And I thought it was a joke at first, uh, but I've seen this movie before because back in, um, it's deja vu all over again for me. Back in the late 90s, I was involved in a scandal for any docs of, uh, in here from Minnesota, remember the medical Alina scandal. I was working for a group of 500 physicians at the time, and I uncovered some uh, questionable uh, transactions and salaries and whatnot that, w that was being hidden from public view. and. Uh, the Attorney General at the time in Minnesota, Mike Hatch, announced uh, an investigation uh, of Medica and Alina, and I, over the next 18 months, I worked behind the scenes providing forensic accounting support for Mike Hatch's office. I was working with Lori Swanson. Uh, at the time, she was the Assistant Attorney General in Minnesota. She's now the Attorney General in Minnesota. So I've seen this movie before, and that's what actually gave me a lot of confidence in pursuing. People have asked me why, basically uncompensated, I've kept at it now for 26 months. And um, the outcome in Minnesota, of course the politics was a lot different in Minnesota. Uh, Hatch was really going after the big bad old HMOs, and uh, it had a lot of public appeal. He uh, eventually broke up Medic and Alina. He fired the board of directors, fired all the top executives. And so that's what I refer to later in the presentation as the Hatch model. As we'll get to in a few minutes, I did meet with the Attorney General's office in Iowa in May and uh, with two attorneys. I did not meet with the Attorney General Tom Miller uh, and basically presented, they were very polite, uh, met with them for 45 minutes and I presented my findings to them and uh, uh, just so they were aware of the story. I've not followed up with them since then. Perhaps some journalists have contacted their office that I've been in touch with. I've been interviewed uh, on uh, camera by CNBC investigations. As Dr. Fisher mentioned, these stories get squashed. Uh, because of, out of political considerations. I was also interviewed by National Public Radio. That story got squashed. Uh, you know, of course, Eichenwald ran with the story. He could smell it from a mile away. And, uh, and I'm, I'm grateful for uh, Kurt on that. So I've seen this movie before. That's my cooking the books quote in the Star Tribune. Uh, the ABMS, ABIM story timeline, I've touched on many of these things. Uh, I immediately, after I tripped over what I was finding, I contacted a number of national media organizations. Um, one of them uh, contacted ABIM, uh, requested 12 years of audited financial statements. And ABIM said, yeah, fine, no problem, we'll, but let's, we'll get back to you. About two or three weeks later, ABIM did get back to the journalist who incidentally was not an investigative journalist. Uh, she was a healthcare reporter. Uh, they basically told her, uh, you know, stick it. We'll meet you, we'll go to New York. We'll meet you in New York. We'll, sh we'll bring one year of uh, audited financial statements. And guess what? We're not even going to let you keep a copy or make a copy. We'll walk in. 
uh, keep in mind this reporter hasn't seen these statements prior to the meeting, will walk in and will quote unquote spend as much time as you need answering your questions and then we'll walk out, we'll take uh, copies back from you and uh, they wouldn't let her keep a copy of the financial statements. That was like strapping an eight cylinder engine on my back because I knew at this point they were hiding something or they had something very embarrassing that they didn't want made public. Granted, 12 years of statements, you know, sounds like overkill, but the fact that they were, uh, uh, would not even leave one copy of the statements to this nationally recognized media organization uh, kind of set things in motion for me. Um, we went to Plan B, which is ABIM Foundation, which is a Pennsylvania corporation, uh, whereas ABIM is, was incorporated in Iowa in 1936. AB, in Pennsylvania, there require, nonprofits are required under most circumstances to file audited financial statements with the state. And lo and behold, uh, it took a call by uh, the media to the Pennsylvania governor's press secretary, believe it or not, uh, to rattle loose uh, two years of financial reports that uh, were sent to me. In the meantime, uh, and I'm just going through some of the, you know, there's been a lack of disclosure on the financial statements in spite of Dr. Barron's assertions to the contrary. He was CEO for 500 days before any financial statements or tax returns were available online. You know, that's his current line is, well, they were available. Well, they weren't available and they probably still wouldn't be available if we didn't pursue this story. Uh, so you can see how it's been uh, morphing into various uh, levels of disclosure. Uh, but uh, between the phone call from the, uh, to the Pennsylvania governor's office to the end of January of 2015, ABIM posted some financial statements. And uh, they, uh, I was worried all along that they had found out that this media organization was requesting the statements and was trying to shut down the request with the state. And as it turns out, they didn't know because they wouldn't have been this stupid. What they did is they posted a, uh, a set of financial statements that omitted a great deal of information that they had submitted in previous years to the state of Pennsylvania. I thought, oh, you know, aren't we clever? Let's omit in, uh, all the, uh, employee and admin expenses and other expenses. The key information was originally omitted from the financial statements that ABIM posted. I went on Twitter, I sent out a Amber Alert on Twitter, you know, looking for these financial statements. <laughs> by uh, by mid-February, they uh, caved and they posted the full set of financial statements. And you might say, okay, well, all right, they did it. You know, this issue really got Kurt Eichenwald uh, all in on this story because he could see the, the scheming that's going on behind, you know, there, what I've been constantly running into is this, con, uh, this pathetic scheming on their part to hide information and to uh, keep this stuff from, uh, the physician community. So uh, I shortly thereafter I went public uh, on YouTube um, 16 questions to test your knowledge of the madcap financial adventures at the American Board of Internal Medicine. This got over 1100 uh, views. A few days later came out the apology from Dr. Barron I don't know if it was, I'm sure it was just coincidence, but maybe he was feeling that the heat was coming. Um, the, uh, a few weeks later, as we can see, the uh, 
ABIM was doing quite well with the new mock program. Their cash doubled from 48 million uh, from 24 million. And uh, I'll show in a little bit how this, this scheme of theirs for the mock bailout of their dire financial circumstances has failed to date. Uh, episode two was everything you always wanted to know about deferred revenue. Uh, deferred revenue is simply prepaid mock and certification cash. In other words, docs will pay 10 years worth of fees and of cash and what ABIM was doing was taking cash for years two through 10 and using that to cover losses in years one. So basically you say, well, how could they have stayed afloat? As Dr. Fisher mentioned, there's 20, 50 million in the hole. How can they possibly stay afloat? Well, it's easy. They've got all this prepaid cash. It's called deferred revenue. So in that uh, episode, I'm exposing the scheme that they were doing to keep themselves afloat and not go bankrupt. Uh, the, uh, of course, in, in March of 15, Eichenwald came out with his first story, and then uh, in April, the second story, and then on May 1st, I met with the Attorney General's office in Iowa, and you can, uh, that's the, you can click on this on the, uh, uh, on the website if you're interested in reading about Iowa's uh, principles and practices for charitable nonprofit excellence, which is in short supply at ABIM. Uh, Eichenwall came out with number three in May after they released their uh, tax returns and then the ridiculous um, denial from Dr. Barron regarding they have never made any effort to obfuscate, hide, or delay ABIM's financial information. Uh, in uh, one, uh, one week later, National Quality Forum, which Dr. Castle was now uh, CEO at, she went from ABIM to uh, NQF, they hired ABIM's lobbying firm. What a coincidence. And then uh, one month later, ABIM terminated their relationship with that lobbying firm. And they paid that lobbying firm 440000 uh, from 2009 to 2015. And then in September, Eichenwald came out with number four. Uh, November of last year, um, ABIM released their 2015 financial statements. And quite cleverly, unlike the prior year, they didn't post ABIM standalone. You say, well, who cares? What difference does that make? The ABIM standalone very readily shows the $50 million deficit on page three of the statement. Now under the, on the consolidated financial report, you have to dig down, drill down, call your accountant, uh, maybe, uh, uh, you know, try and find it. It's on page 21. So basically they no longer post the ABIM standalone financial statement. And the other thing that they did, curiously, they're invested in over 50 million in non-public uh, partnership that's invested in the Cayman Islands that Dr. Fisher mentioned. Uh, that's a very high risk uh, investment. They removed what's called the level three designation on that, and in accounting speak, that means high risk, difficult to value investments. So for two years, this non-public partnership was labeled as high risk and it magically disappeared as a high risk investment. And, and they found a loophole to uh, squeeze through and get that designation off of there. Uh, and then of course in April, Oklahoma here uh, signed uh, Senate Bill 1148 banning mock. Uh, in May, 990s were released and then the Cayman Islands were disclosed for the first time uh, in June, after the AMA meeting, uh, or at the AMA meeting, AMA approved Resolution 309, which called for the immediate end of mandatory uh, secured recertifying exam. 
Uh, finally, the most recent uh, disclosure was that uh, the, and this is, it was disclosed for the first time this month, the, the ABIM retirement plan, they're required to file it with the federal government. Uh, the value of the retirement plan is equal to 80 years of value of ABIM. And I want you to think about that. Let that sink in for a minute. Millions of dollars in mock fees, millions of dollars in certification fees over the last 80 years, stock market performance, uh, gains on stock market investments. You throw that all into a big pot after 80 years, and guess what? It's, e it's worth no more, it's worth, ex the retirement plan is worth what 80 years of value has brought to ABIM. I think that's the most outrageous thing I've ever seen. They, we'll see in a minute how ABIM's value has uh, been in, a, it's been in a slow motion death spiral for the last uh, 16 years. I'll just quickly go through this. This is the, uh, their value, ABIM's value back in 2000 was 62 million. And fund balance, don't get hung up on the accounting speak, it's just basically assets minus liabilities, was 62 million in 2000, it's down to 26 million. I wouldn't be surprised if it goes below 20 million in the upcoming financial statements to be, to be released in early November. Uh, they've been hemorrhaging cash. They've had consolidated operating losses of 59 million since 2009. Uh, the money trail I just put in there uh, for purposes if uh, ABIM were to challenge these numbers, we don't need to go through them in detail, but the numbers all tie out. And as I like to say, I stand by their numbers. They have never contacted me to make a correction. If I, made a, if I ever made a mistake, I would certainly have corrected it. They have never contacted me once that my numbers are incorrect. Uh, just their payroll is up 43%. You can see their employees, uh, they have 85 employees that are paid more than 100,000. Uh, that's up from 33 in 2009. Um, and then the, what I was referring to earlier about deferred revenue, uh, kind of uh, providing them the cash to stay alive. They've had an infusion of all this prepaid cash that's uh, helped cover their losses. And uh, this is the mock bailout scheme is dead on arrival. You know, I'm sure it was all high fives, you know, on Walnut Street uh, back in uh, 2013. They, or 2014, they thought they had this nailed, mock would bail them out, and they saw an increase of mock revenue of 7.7 million. Unfortunately for them, there was a decrease in certification exam revenue of 5 million uh, from 2013 to 2015. Uh, they're, of course, their spending is out of control, and lo and behold, that's up 6 million. And then overhead, management in general is up nearly 19%. Uh, that accounts for about 2.3 million. So basically, all the money, the 7.7 .7 million in, in mock that they brought, mock cash that they brought in, I believe, it's my theory that uh, that was a scheme to bail them out financially. It backfired. They've actually gone down. They've had losses, net losses of 5674000 So from 2000, uh, 13 to 2015. So it's been an epic failure in so many words. I mentioned my meeting with the Attorney General's office in Iowa. That's just the, uh, the sh showing you the drop from uh, 1997 to 2015 in the deficit of ABIM. It, again, it's incorporated in Iowa. Uh, that was the cover letter for my meeting with the Attorney General in Iowa. And then my recommendation to them was that they replace the Board of Directors, Officers, and Top Financial and Operations Management, that they liquidate this non-publicly traded partnership, 
uh, which is held by the foundation. And once that's liquidated, uh, dissolve the foundation. I, don't, I personally don't see any business purpose to the foundation. And then send the assets back to ABIM and restore their fund balance. And then finally, this, all this prepaid mock stuff, the cash that's been coming in uh, that got them in trouble in the first place, either set up some type of reserve or restrict ABIM's access to that cash. Um, and interestingly, there was a Pennsylvania case where directors of nonprofits were held financially liable for lying on incompetent officers and lack of oversight. That was a court case last year. And you can see from that tweet that I sent out the uh, $4.5 million in director's fees paid uh, to ABIM and foundation directors. So, you know, it certainly smells like hush money to me, um, but I'll let you be the judge of that. And that's my presentation.